Good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the first Childkind webinar. We're so thrilled that over 300 people from all over the world really have signed up to be on this Zoom call. My name is Neil Schechter, and, and I'm a pain physician at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I'm the CEO of Childkind. We're fortunate today to host Dr. Chris Eccleston, who's director of the amazing Bath Center for Pain Research, and Chris will be sharing his thoughts on the future of pediatric pain management. For those of you who are unaware, Childkind is a nonprofit initiative of the, that grew out of the Special Interest Group on Pain and Childhood of the International Association for the Study of Pain. Um, its mission is to reduce the pain that children experience in healthcare facilities around the world. And Childkind is based on the premise that change can only be sustained if there's an institutional commitment to it. So we recognize institutions that have made the provision of comfort an important part of their culture. And we certify them as, quote, child kind hospitals. There are now 11 child kind hospitals with many more in the pipeline. And there are even efforts to create a child kind city and we would welcome your participation in this venture. So check us out on the internet, childkindinternational.org. We've chosen to present this webinar on September 11th, which is a very solemn and sad day in the United States. And yet another unfortunate example of the meaningless cruelty that people can inflict on each other. We thought, what better way to highlight our better angels and emphasize the good that we can do for each other than by addressing the pain in those who are most vulnerable. And that's the genesis of today's webinar. Today's webinar is dedicated to Dr. Maureen Strafford, um, truly one of those better angels. Maureen, who died about one year ago, was a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist and an early pioneer in pain medicine. She was a tireless advocate for children and was an early and vigorous supporter of Childkind and this initiative. She lit up every room that she entered with her incandescent energy and she represented all that was good in our profession, generous listening, deep and genuine compassion and a brilliant clinical mind. Late in her career, when illness limited her ability to do anesthesia, Maureen spent time working on the mindfulness, on the use of mindfulness in treating pain in children. And that provides a very nice segue into introducing our today's speaker. Most of you are likely familiar with Dr. Chris Eccleston, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Bath and director of the Bath Center for Pain Research which is a remarkable, remarkable institution. I assume that's why so many of you have decided to join us this, this afternoon, morning, or evening. So I won't waste time on a lengthy introduction. Um, suffice to say, Chris has been an international thought leader and innovator in the area of pain in children for many years. His 250 publications don't begin to explain the impact he's had on this field through his original research, through his leadership of the Cochrane Review Panels and his editorial activities at the journal Pain. His work has made us reconsider what we think we know when we're treating patients by confronting us with the harsh realities of what we really know and what is actually known in the field. It points us to areas that require more and better research. Chris's impact on the field has been acknowledged through his receipt of the prestigious Ronald Melzack Award for his contributions to the science of pain. Over the year, past year, Chris has led a panel of 20 international experts and patients in far-ranging far discussions on pediatric pain under the auspices of The Lancet. This commission was supported generously by the May Day Fund, which as many of you know, uh, works very hard to advance the cause of the humane treatment of adults and children with pain. The full report of The Lancet Commission on Pediatric Pain will be published in The Lancet uh, in October but Chris has generously offered to share some of the results of those deliberations with us today. Um, there should be some time at the end of this presentation for questions. Uh, please send them to us through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Chris, could I have the next slide? Um, um, uh, sign up for our website. Again, direct your questions to me specifically. Thank you for joining us. And it's my pleasure to welcome Chris Eccleston to this discussion. Chris. Okay, thank you, uh, Neil. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. What I'd uh, like to do is to spend some time talking about 
uh, the Time for Change program that we put together, which is around uh, the future of pediatric pain management, as you suggest. Sounds rather grand, but really trying to better understand uh, where the gaps in our knowledge are and what are the things that we need to do better and how we can uh, bring our, our, our talents together to achieve that. Um, I have no disclosures, but um, I wanted to start with a little bit of history because sometimes when people present uh, these sort of present, th th these talks, they can all seem terribly polished as if there was something that we, uh, there was a grand plan that we were following from the very beginning. And I, it really wasn't like that. And I just want to share that with you. And I want to put out a call for never apologizing for, uh, for um, good fortune and never apologizing for serendipity. And I won't tell you the full story, but I wanted to take a few steps back just to explain how we managed to be trying to contribute in this field. Back in 1994, uh, we had an opportunity to set up an adult intensive rehabilitation pain management service at the fancily named Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases in Bath in the southwest of the UK, which um, as commonly known as the Mineral Water Hospital, and that's the picture that you see on your left. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, if if you, anybody wants lessons in dealing with, with um, uh, imposter syndrome at the age of 26, when people are suggesting that you might set up a new service, it was really rather daunting. And there were a number of things that happened when we pulled in, uh, for example, the book that you see there, Pain Treatment Centers at a Crossroads. I thought that was a tremendously important contribution. It's an old book now, and I ask you, probably many people will not have seen it. Some of you uh, who are longer in the tooth like me may remember it, but it was actually a really very important contribution. And the lesson there is that books can matter. It can matter enormously as you're trying to put together new services and trying to think about the way uh, things might run. And we put together this uh, center, which very much at the time focused on adults and, and that uh, target, that blue target you see there was the actual logo at the time that we've now dropped. And it had this wonderful strap line, which was called enabling people to reduce the impact of pain on their lives and influencing society's attitude to pain. And I was very proud of this particular slogan that we put together. Uh, we had some management consultants in, we put together this slogan. Everybody was able to recite this, uh, uh, all together, we didn't have a song, but everybody could recite it. And then one day, this person in the middle, Patrick McGrath, came to visit us. He's an old friend of mine. And he said, Chris, you know, the problem is you need to change this slogan. It's wrong. And I was affronted. I was, I was really quite concerned. I think, what do you mean? We spent so much time. And he said, well, actually, you're not doing that. You're, you're not enabling people. You're only enabling adults. What are you going to do about the, the young people that are being referred to you or that you're sending away? And it really set off. This, uh, this sort of firework in the whole uh, hospital actually saying, he's right, we need to do something about this. So actually, I, I don't want to say the full story around that because then, then lots of different things happened and what you see on the right now is that there is a fully fledged, uh, very large back uh, center for pain services, our sister center clinically, we're still running, still seeing lots of young people. Um, but really it's about how does change happen? because that's part of what I'm interested in today. How, does the, how do these changes come about? It's not always down to a grand plan. It's often around challenging each other, saying, well, you seem a bit smug about that. Are you sure that it's right? Or maybe you could have a bit more courage to think in this way. So research-wise, we've done lots of different things. I'm very interested in the theory of psychology and how we think about bodies and how we make sense of a body that's struggling with you, that's challenging you, that's reminding you that, that you're not just a, a mental being, that the, the physical presence is impinging on your everyday life, on your plans, on your dreams, on your hopes. Um, but we're also interested in how do you set up uh, a proper services? What's the, what's the scale of services? And in this case, looking across uh, Europe, we looked at all of the, the investments in pain services, and I'll say a bit more about why that was important to us in a moment. And then more recently, we've been thinking across the lifespan about the role that working lives play, and goodness me, is that more important now um, in, in, uh, as, we st as the whole of people's work life starts to change, including what I mean work more broadly is occupation and schooling and spending time in the, in the occupations that, that we have to spend time in or we choose to spend time in. So we're very interested in the center on a whole range of different questions. And I just invite you to 
to uh, praise yourself of some of the things that, that we've done. And, uh, and it's not me, although uh, uh, very kind of, of Neil to give me that over generous introduction. It's really the work of quite a lot of people. Ed Keogh, who runs the center with me, is very interested in individual differences and in particular in sex and gender differences. Lisa Austin's been pretty much running the center and keeping us safe for most of that time. And you can see the people there. Janet Bultitude is interested in uh, multi-sensory integration. Joe Daniels is really leading our clinical program and very interested in applying health anxiety models to, uh, which is peculiarly important at the moment in the face of a global uh, epidemic, in the face of a pandemic. She's really better trying to understand how we respond to being fearful about health and disease. Um, Emma Fisher, uh, who will be known to many of you and probably on this call, has been really tirelessly working in, in better understanding evidence uh, applied to pediatric chronic pain, but also really now pioneering our understanding of, of what the risks of, of chronic pain in adolescence are happening earlier in life, in particular post-surgical and post-injury. Abby Jordan, I think, is also with us, has really pushed our, our knowledge and qualitative research and understanding uh, fathers and family uh, setups and and uh, Elaine Wainwright, as you saw on the right, is helping me in the work and pain field and really leading Matt and Abby Tabor, who's a physiotherapist, uh, a scholar in our unit, is really pushing our embodiment work. So it's not just me. Please do appraise yourself for the work that people are doing. It's really quite remarkable. And I just feel terribly fortunate to have these uh, people um, you know, willing to put up with me. But as Neil said, one of the things I've been doing for the last 10 years is, is working as the coordinating editor of the Cochrane Pain Palliative and Supportive uh, uh, Cochrane Review Group. And um, that's been an interesting journey because uh, the real challenge is how do we bring uh, evidence-based medicine to the field of, of pediatric pain, specifically for, the, for this presentation. And that's been a challenge in how do you help people make decisions when there's very little evidence and the evidence is of variable quality. Um, but I think it is a major resource. If you've been involved in a, in a Cochrane review, you'll know just how much work was involved in it and how detailed they are. Um, but also, if you're a practicing clinician, you'll also know that, that you're probably mightily frustrated with the conclusion of a lot of those reviews which say that we're not quite sure and we need more evidence. But I think I, one of the things I'm particularly passionate about is actually making that statement meaningful to people, is asking people to say, okay, this is the current state of the evidence, but how do we help people go further? It's not enough to communicate around the uncertainties in an evidence base. We really need to help people who need to make dichotomous go, no go decisions when they're working clinically. It's not enough to say, well, I can educate you all about uh, the confidence intervals around the, how confident we feel in the decisions you make, and you've got to make that decision. And that really has been the way that I've tried to approach evidence-based medicine in pediatric pain. So we've done quite a bit. These are all free resources. If you don't have access to them wherever you are in the world, just email me and I will send them to you. Everything we have is, is, in, is open science and in publicly available, but I want you to see it, but not hiding it from anybody. Here's a couple of highlighted reviews led by uh, Emma Fisher and Emily Law from uh, Seattle. Really wanted to, in, in our, my core business was looking at the evidence for psychological therapies for the management of chronic and recurrent pain. So that's the updated review that, that's been there since I think 2012 or 2013. And, but we we're also interested in how you deliver these types of therapies remotely and uh, uh, what types of therapies there are for parents and uh, psychological interventions for for parents of children and adolescents with chronic illness. They're all, all of those studies are there. And if you don't know that they're, they're a very useful resource for you, I'm just raising your awareness to that. As I said earlier, we also work with adults, which will be unusual in this community. But actually one of the things that we learned quite early on is that many of the adults with chronic pain, in fact, 20% of the adults who present to, to pain services with, with chronic pain had pain starting in childhood that went untreated. So uh, it's not as far away to be thinking, how do we understand the plight of people who are actually uh, struggling to make sense of, of their pain as adults? And also, as we've known from, from research uh, from colleagues around the world, that having parents and adults around you in your community with chronic pain is a particular uh, influence on the children in those families growing up. So that's become quite important. I just wanted to show you this 
this, uh, this, this paper because it came out about three weeks ago and it's the update of the very early 2012 adult chronic uh, review of, of psychological interventions for adult chronic pain. It's been a long time coming and, it's, and it makes for some interesting reading for those of you who are interested in psychotherapies more broadly. But so we did all of that and then, and then we, people started to say it was another one of those serendipitous moments where people were saying, why are you so obsessed with this psychology stuff, Chris? It's just, I mean, yeah, I know it's interesting, but actually it's not what most people receive. Most people receive pharmacological interventions. So we, again, I, I, I get very annoyed when people point out that I'm wrong, but then I have to realize that actually I'm wrong. So we really need to start better understanding what the evidence is for non-psychological interventions are, as I like to call them. So we uh, then uh, set about, uh, we, we wrote a grant as we do as academics, we, we won some money, we hired a number of people, and we produced a, a, a whole series of reviews on the very slim pickings on the very little evidence that there is for most pharmacological interventions. And it was really quite sobering because I've spent a lot of time in the, in the deep trenches trying to improve the quality and the quantity of psychological treatment, trials of psychological treatments. Never really fully understood that a lot of the quality issues that I was dealing with are across the board. In, in, uh, we, we see in, in, in trials of pharmacological interventions, and there are very few uh, trials of pharmacological interventions. So rather than ask people to read all those individual reviews, we put together this overview review, which is available in pain, which is a way of looking across all of those different pharmacological interventions. And again, that's, that's available. And if, if you find it behind a, a paywall, just write to me or email me and I'll send it to you. And really, the bottom line of this very large piece of work was that we have very little solid evidence uh, from trial data. We have a lot of evidence from clinical practice, but very little evidence from trial data. And it's almost as if, and this, became, this becomes political, it's almost as if people have decided that that's okay, that we don't need evidence. And I know there's a broad history here, but I want to put it in its, in its most stark state, and we wrote it in there. But in order to get enough evidence at the rate of, of that we're running, of running randomized controlled trials of pharmacological interventions in pediatric pain, it'll take us a thousand years, a thousand years to have an evidence base that begins to look like the adult evidence base that we have. Because people, despite the attempts that we've made in FDA, despite the attempts that we've made in, in, the, in the European Regulation Agency, it seems to be okay that we can just not bother running trials. And it really got me, got me thinking, why is that okay? So what we decided to do then is we decided this, this is where Time for Change was born from. I'll just go ahead one slide, sorry. We put together, the, um, a whole program called Time for Change. I think it's back off. And if you, this is the website and it's run under, under the Cochrane PAPAS website. If you went there and you clicked Time for Change, what you see is a whole set of resources freely available for you. If you're in the business of thinking of setting up new services or you want to look at uh, the reimbursement uh, profile of individual services, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, if you're working in primary care and general practice or you're working in in a secondary or a tertiary care center and you want to know what the evidence is, we've done our best to bring it all together. But my job now is to look at what next, is to say, well, how do we make that thousand years different? How do we bring that forward? That's what my role is. So I, uh, we gathered people together in London, for those of you who remember London, it's a big city in, in, in Europe, you know, it has a river, it has a house, it has a parliament where people make dubious decisions. And that's the picture that you have on the right. It's a very beautiful place. If we ever get to travel again, come and visit. We pulled people together in London at, the, at a meeting funded by the Wellcome Foundation for a large medical charity in the UK, a huge medical charity to fund uh, research and, and policy work in a number of areas. They have a, a, a beautiful centre called the Wellcome Collection. That's what you see on the left of your slide, which is on the Euston Road in London. And that's the reading room there. It's stunningly beautiful. It's an incredibly historic place. We didn't actually go in that room. We went in a windowless basement underneath, but I don't have a picture of that. So I thought I'd show you the picture of the room that I, that in my imagination that we were meeting in. 
we decided to pull lots of people together, but they weren't the normal people. They weren't the people that already believe what we say. They were journal editors, politicians, uh, journalists, regulators, uh, um, uh, hospital executives. We tried to pull people together and say, uh, not to educate them about the problem, but to ask them what some possible solutions might be. It's a fascinating event. There's a report on it um, that Emma Fisher had put together, which is on the our Time for Change website. But one of the things that came out of it is that Jane Godson, who's the uh, chief editor of, the, of Lancet Child and Health, uh, said to us, uh, would you consider, as Neil suggested, putting together a special commission? I said, yes, of course. And then I said, what's a special commission? I know those, uh, of course, those answers were supposed to go the other way around, but that was the way it came out. And I said, okay. Uh, and so she, she educated me. She said, well, we put together these 40,000 word documents. You bring people from around the world. Um, and we have a, a lots of different resources. And we, we try and ask questions about what next. And we try and make sure that the, when you put it together, you don't just write a typical textbook type story. So we put together a group of, of, of stellar people. And there they are uh, meeting in New York. Uh, which was, I think, I can't actually remember when it was, but it looks dark, so it must have been winter of last year, or the, the end of last year, or the beginning of this year. And, uh, and, then, and the name of this is Delivering a Transformative um, uh, chronic, chronic Pain Management in Pediatric Pain. You can see it there. And there's a wonderful picture of us in New York. And uh, actually, I've got a picture of New York behind me. I put the lights and the bridge on. So so we could be anywhere in the world, anymore. so I just thought I'd add some color there, you can see that. And what was particularly interesting about this, and again, it was about serendipity, about not apologizing for good fortune and having such tremendous people around, is that some of these people here were just, just um, outstanding in the way that they were willing to think differently and pushing us to think differently. So what we do, because we've written lots, I've written lots of papers, as Neil embarrassingly said. So, and so I know how to write papers, but I know how to write papers um, that, that look like an academic has written them. What we really wanted to do was to do something. We wanted to say, how might, uh, what are the real challenges? What are the transformative goals? What are the things that really need to change in pediatric pain? And this is not just chronic pain, this is all pediatric pain. This is an opportunity to get these international minds together, including patient, full patient represents, representation, and really try and say, what could be different? And what, how might we approach this differently? And as Neil said, it is embargoed until the 14th, I think we've just moved it, it's going to be launched on the 13th of October, and there'll be a lot of press and a lot of, of um, communication about it. But I just wanted to give you uh, for the first time, actually, this audience a heads up on the types of things that, that we'd be talking about. Now, the audience for this review is probably not most of you and I. It's people who are policymakers, people who are in power, people who are setting up services, who are listening to other people who want to set up services, people who are trying to transform care, people who hold the pairs, people who are funding. It's those people who really want to get to, want to speak their language, want to talk to them. So this is what we came up with. We have four transformative goals. And really, in some ways, they're relatively straightforward. What we want to do, if this were successful, is we want to make pain matter. We want to make pain understood. We want to make pain visible. And ultimately, we want to make pain better or the people who are uh, experiencing pain better. So what the, this, this, uh, this group of people did was, was, was go together around those goals. And then we, we um, had a small breakout groups so where individuals were able to work on, on each of those four goals, and then we brought people together. The first is really around making pain matter, and this just shows how it's different. This normally comes last in the types of uh, briefings and presentations that, that we write. It's normally this, the social science or the psychological science sometimes is what comes at the end of the textbook rather than at the beginning. And I uh, wanted, in particular, wanted to fight for it to be at the beginning. And one of the reasons for that is that, that there was a very strong patient voice in this commission, which was exercised by, uh, the, by the inequalities and the inequities in our current provision of pain management services. And I don't just mean in terms of access to service. They have quite a, quite a, a, a sophisticated understanding of inequity, not just inequality. 
And so we wanted that to be front and center. We wanted that to be at the beginning. And that really then took us down a journey of trying better to understand the social science of, of pain and, the, and uh, the anthropology, the sociology, uh, the political science behind it. And it becomes interesting. I, I, will, I will share with you that there isn't a, a mature, rich scene of social science in pain research and pain science. There are lots of in, uh, small, uh, inter, uh, unconnected individuals historically who've been astonishingly good um, scholars, academics, if you like, in their individual fields. I can, I can name them another time when we're talking about the sociology of pain from around the world who've made major contributions. But what there isn't, if you like, is a, is a cohort of people, even within IASP, who are really caring about better understanding the sociology, anthropology, political science, etc., of pain. And we need it. This is what we need if we're going to make pain matter, because fundamentally pain, for all sorts of, of, of complex social reasons, lends itself to silence. It is silencing. It's silencing of you as an individual who get uh, uh, fatigued by your own complaints. It's silencing by institutions and organizations who don't like to hear problems that they can't solve. So really, they want not to be able to talk about it. It's silencing in, in, the, in the sense that lots of people don't have access. We know, uh, and a number of people on this call have done some of this work, that training is very low in, 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 typical, in, in, in typical medical curriculum, uh, be that um, of any health professional training, uh, that the amount of hours that go into it, the amount of practice, the amount of discussion and pain is very low, despite its ubiquity as a, as a symptom and a sign of other disorders. We know there's a huge risk of the atrogenic disorder from, from uh, the inappropriate treatment of patients with pain and young people with pain. And we know there's a lot of what euphemistically has become known, at least in the US, as low value practice. And what that really means is, is doing things that don't actually work, that you really need to disengage and disinvest in, uh, from investigations that are, are meant to be reassuring, but actually are just costing money and just prolonging chronic pain and uh, not actually often being reassuring right through to uh, moving people from one specialist to another. And that's an interesting field in itself. Challenging, I know it's challenging, this is a challenging talk from this point of view, but we wanted that front and center right at the point to define what those problems are, to better understand why they come about, but also to point to where things like child kind, which, is, which comes through very strong in this section, where we tried to have knowledge mobilization the same as uh, with SCIP, the same with some of the uh, amazing um, knowledge mobilization efforts that are going on in, in Canada. Um, in particular, I think the UK and Europe have been very poor in these areas, but where there are good examples of where people can bring a, a voice back into the open, bring that patient voice back and bring that knowledge mobilization a skill and expertise to bear, then we've tried to shine a light. So that's what, that's what you'll find in those sections about making pain map. Making pain understood is also what is the bit that you'd normally find at the beginning, which is better understanding the biological and, so, and psychological mechanisms that, that actually drive uh, uh, pain experience and pain behavior. And, I'll, and so here we were being deliberately philosophical. We want to leave uh, Descartes behind to better understand how those dualisms help us and how they don't really being very clear about when we're talking about nociception or how pain is actually transmitted uh, before it becomes the experience rather than the, the lived experience of pain that people have. So being clear about our measurements. So what are we measuring? Are we measuring pain? Are we measuring, um, are we measuring nociception? There's still a significant problem in holding this field back in that the epidemiology is still not very well uh, uh, classified and documented, the nosology is really quite poor, the science of understanding, the naming of the different disorders within chronic pain, we really need to, to discuss, we discussed how we need to improve that. And of course, uh, most, some of the major advances in developmental biology, both, both in animal developmental biology and uh, transferring and translating that back into humans as, as well, is well uh, reviewed in this area so that we can understand what both the central and the peripheral higher order mechanisms are. And also there's a plea in the better understanding for the biomarkers that we might use. Uh, and this comes back to the better epidemiology and nosology. 
And then lastly, I think, and I don't know why this has not happened in this field, there are good examples of having clinical registries where we can actually follow the experience of patients internationally have been done in adult uh, pain experience. They've been done in other uh, pediatric fields, but we have this is a real challenge for us in this field. And we want to say, we're going to really make pain understood. We really need to have better collaboration and improve our, our registries um, following the identification of of patients with particular pain disorders and, and whatever treatment was offered for them. Making pain visible is all about uh, really driving home that we know that, that all child pain should be assessed. It's not something that's optional. It can be assessed. There are multiple technologies that are available. Some of them are harder to understand than others if you're not a specialist, but they can be trained. There's an enormous amount of, of education and training and knowledge translation. There are techniques, there are people have been putting out that information to help people uh, really try and better understand how to measure pain and pain related uh, experience at all levels at all ages and all stages of development and within all disorders it is possible to do it's not okay to say it's too difficult it is possible to do and not just the actual pain experience sometimes as pain uh, specialists we get a little obsessed by pain obviously we think it's the only thing that matters but actually one of the things that we've done a tremendous amount of work on over the years is understanding the impact of pain on other aspects of life on cognition on emotion on broad behavior on uh, on um, lifespan on a whole range of different variables and, and taking account of that holistic approach is really quite important we know how to do measurement. We know the philosophy of measurement. What the real challenges in this area is how to take things in to be more dynamic so we can measure people in their own setting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and lastly, of course, what we really want to do is make pain better. And that means promoting evidence-based medicine, really having a better understanding of why we're doing the things that we're doing, um, understanding where the gaps in that evidence are and how, how to manage the absence of that evidence, as I said earlier. Um, we really need to better understand why uh, we, there isn't a, a bigger investment in new trials and to, to lobby and to push and to get policymakers to help us with that. Of course, not, trials are not the only thing that matters, and there are some good reasons why we don't do clinical trials in pediatric chronic pain, especially in some of the more rare disorders and especially in some of the more rare cases. Um, but I, we shouldn't let those reasons get in the way of there being more major investments in this area. Um, Tony Palermo, a colleague of mine, was only saying uh, recently how, how um, little of the HEAL initiative, for example, had gone toward pediatric pain. Systematically across the board, not just in one country, but around the world, what we see is people saying, well, it's a bit difficult, maybe we shouldn't do that. Actually, it's been done in other fields and we can do it. That said, trials aren't everything. There is a tremendous amount of information, a tremendous amount of experience. There's a lot of uh, other ways, and, and we point to, uh, to those in, in this particular section, where we can actually personalize people's experience, where we can look, for example, in, in, uh, in, in uh, pharmacokinetics in, in interventions, where we can look individually at what's actually happening with the interventions that you're prescribing and using with the individual patient. Trials aren't everything. And there are ways in which we can embrace that complexity and we can increase the personalization as well as, as improving the access to treatments that we know are effective. So that's in a nutshell, in, a, in 10 minutes, if you like, what the, this uh, 35,000 to 40,000 words is going to say. It's going to say it in detail. It's going to say it with a rhetorical flourish. It's going to say it uh, in multiple different ways. It's going to be extraordinarily well referenced and. Uh, and it's going to be something that we're offering as a potential tool for people to use. But here's what I want to talk to you about, if you like, from that, because I got thinking about, remember that first slide when I told you about um, uh, the region helped me when I was trying to set up a new service in a place where there wasn't a service, where there wasn't a history of a service, um, and there were lots of resources at the time and that was one of them and we followed them and that's what we did and in fact uh, the international association for the study of pain and it's still on the website if you want to look at it put together a special i think it was a task force they called it to define pain treatment centers this is back in 2009 hasn't been updated since then and it's interesting because what they do is they say well uh, the the, the 
best thing you could possibly be is a, is a fully fledged multidisciplinary pain clinic. And then they said, but actually, uh, and, and it's not quite like childcare. I think they wanted to move towards having accreditation and having training and giving people recognition for that. I don't think they, they moved to that. I, I say they, I was on this committee, so I should remember. But that was the idea is how do we help people say this is the optimal model if you're thinking about setting up services all very nice. And then they define types of things. So wanting to get increasing specialization in pain practice, but recognizing that there are individual specialists who are acting alone uh, or, or with just one or two people. And actually there are some people who are only offering individual treatments like a biofeedback clinic or a spinal clinic, and they shouldn't be calling themselves um, multidisciplinary pain centers. That's it's the sort of idea at the time. That was what people were discussing. And then I think uh, we were, uh, uh, the other book I showed you earlier on, when we looked at 30, uh, I, I, I helped uh, uh, to basically doing an audit of 37 countries in Europe and looking at all of their investments in pain, what their history was, how much money they had, what their population needs were, how many centers they had, how many patients that they had. And it was really quite sobering to do, and it really caught me short because although there are many wealthy nations that have this, this, these uh, regional and, and national multidisciplinary pain clinic centers, and I'm not criticizing them because I set one up, so just like that. Actually, do you know uh, what the truth is, is that, that most people are operate, operating as in single disciplines, that there's an enormous inequity of access and experience. Um, psychology skills that, are probably, that we uh, and people like me and I will happily talk to you about how important psychology is and how terrific the outcomes are. But access to a psychologist who knows about pain is extremely rare. Beth uh, Donnell did a really nice piece of work, even to, done a number of pieces of work in this area. One just showing access to specialist pain services. This is both this is in adults and adolescents and, and young people. But that even then looking at general psychology referrals, pain skills are very rare. That's what we're dealing with. And of course, there's a lot of low value service. So one of the things that I, that I, that I came away from that is actually standard care around the world. And I'm happy because I can't see you as an audience, but I really like your feedback for this. Maybe not in your center, maybe not what you see every day, but standard care is no care. And let me tell you a small, small story about this. When I was, running a, a clinical center, we were, we, we were running full on complicated interdisciplinary residential intensive rehabilitation services with a quite an advanced psychological model. We were very pleased with ourselves. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's excellent, it's very good and they're, they're complex patients really need that and they do well. And we had a visitor from uh, rural India. He spent uh, four months with us. He's a tremendous physician. He was a really very good rehabilitation physician. And he would spend every, every single session with us. He would follow all of the patients and he spent hours and hours uh, working with us on the center. And I said to him one day, I was probably wanting a compliment. And I said, uh, Ashraf, tell me, uh, tell me, what have you, as you go back, what have you learned? And he looked at me and he said, I, I've learned how to do steroid injections better. And I was nonplussed because I'm thinking we don't do that it's not something and and then he explained he said Chris this has been really fascinating for me and I've taken every possibility to learn intellectually and academically about what you're doing but the reality of my clinic is that there's me sat in a room in this case in rural India where the, every day when he opens up there's a queue of 300 people outside the door in, uh, and, and, and actually, one of the things that really struck me is that how good are our models of care? And the current models most people are, are running are actually really are running on a tightrope and they're not getting to enough people. So it's not only me saying things like this. Is it time to flip? This was a nice piece of work that um, Carl from, uh, uh, um, from, from um, the US really was pushing, saying even at a curriculum level, a number of years ago, he was saying that rather than doing a biopsychosocial model, we should be doing a psycho, a socio psycho bio model and saying that maybe he believes that the now standard approach to pain education, which is really almost like treating, uh, uh, taking people who want to learn to drive and then teaching them about an internal combustion engine, but not actually teaching them about the road or teaching them how to drive or teaching them what happens or teaching them what the signals are. So maybe there is a time to flip it and make things that are different. 
And then, of course, we were thinking about these ideas, and I wanted to introduce you to them. And I, I want, we were all setting up to, to write, if you like, a, a new investigation to follow that really important um, book that helped me enormously back in 1994, was to say, how might we think about new models of care? How, and then COVID comes along. So uh, never waste a good crisis, as been said by a number of people. We put together, uh, we, we work very hard to try and help people move online, but we're learning a lot now, and a lot of people are, are getting information about how we might improve the services that we're offering. But of course, we're all a little bit in the same boat, aren't we? We're all this experiment that COVID-19 has thrust upon us. It means that we are struggling. Let's be fair, and some people are doing it extraordinarily well. Um, and what it reminds me of, and a friend of mine said, well, it's a bit like what we're doing now and what I'm doing to you now and speaking with you is a bit like really bad television from the 70s and the 80s, where if you remember in different countries, if you wanted to access uh, intellectual content, if you wanted to see academic things, then you'd switch on a television and somebody would just, normally a sort of pale, male and stale um, so, sort of a white professor with bad hair would stand there and look at you uh, and just talk at you in a monotone, we'd teach you individually. And in some ways, that's, that's the stage that we're at. So much so, I mean, that was me doing exactly that on, a, on, a, on another lecture that somebody did a screen grab of, is that it's really not yet, we're not yet able, we're really only at the beginning, it's not a criticism, we're just at the beginning of trying to understand how we do the how we do better in this area but it's a great opportunity um, uh, and, and if we're to avoid uh, new harms that are happening especially just an advert for the work that's that's already in press by the way is in sitting in the ISP um, uh, publication uh, so the pain journals um, publication ahead of print listing because as in press there's a whole series on on cannabinoids and there's a particular piece by Eric Kelso that says is a real potential for harm at the moment, um, especially in COVID. But if we're going to, this is the challenge I have for you, if we're going to rethink the multidisciplinary or even the chronic pain treatment facility for young people, this, this uh, diagram comes from the, toward the end of the Lancet Commission, is how do we re-engineer the chronic pain treatment facility for young people? How do we think differently about it? And one way that we're really going to have to start to think about it is to embrace what modern technology can do, rather than this version that we're using now in education, which we're doing a good job of doing the best of it, but rather than just trying to replace what we would do face to face with some intermediate technology, how do we flip the whole treatment model? And that partly what that means, and we discuss that briefly in this paper, is how are we going to move towards shifting the model of expertise into like into a sense machine learning sense so we can push it out to multiple people in multiple ways in different parts of the world in different formats with different um, uh, practitioners I'm not suggesting i have the answer for you but i do have the challenge for you and there's a lot that we should do to make the most of this covid experiment that we're in Remember what telemedicine does is it has the opportunity to improve access to treatments that already exist. It has the opportunity to personalize those treatments and it has the opportunity to increase it at scale, either using the pervasive technology that everybody has in their pockets or introducing new technologies and new ideas. We have a lot of those skills, but it might mean us being uncomfortable and working with other people. I know that there are people on this call who are much further ahead than me in this area, what I'm trying to do is to paint a broader picture of better understanding what the barriers are to us flipping, or depending on what language you use, flipping the model, um, uh, disinvesting from other services, trying to find a better way of being creative and innovative and making the most of this, of this crisis that we're currently in. Because we can do it, and really what part of that is about is focusing on the small data that people leave about their lives that we are littering the world with data that could be used to help better understand the presentations of, of patients and their families when they come to see us and ask for help. And there's a very good computer scientist uh, called Deb Estrin in, in uh, New York who really has been leading this work on small data possibilities. I just signpost that for you for those of you who are in 
interesting. So this is the challenge, and then I'm going to stop and ask you, uh, and maybe we'll try and take some questions and great to have a conversation, if not here somewhere else. This is my challenge to you. It's a challenge for 2030. We've set out what we think that these uh, the, the, the four transformative goals should be quite broadly of making pain better, making pain understood, making pain visible and uh, making pain matter, really making it matter, forcing a conversation about why it really is important and why, uh, this, the, why we need to challenge the silencing around pain. But the way we might do that is to really invest uh, our collective thoughts when you have time from not making sure you've seen the next patient and making sure you've followed up with that patient. You're really trying to say, how might we completely reimagine the pediatric pain treatment facility? Because we're in a situation where we have tremendous expertise scattered around the world. What standard care is no care around the world. No care. So really, how do we use that model to flip it and create something new? That's my challenge to you, and I hope that you uh, join me in that uh, as we spend the next decade together. Thank you. Oh, I will say before I go to questions, what you have on your left is a QR code. Uh, and if you just put your telephone over it or you know how to use QR code, it'll take you to a questionnaire. I'm going to leave it up, but it'll be really nice if people were able to um, give us some feedback. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That was uh, fabulous. Uh, uh, we're waiting for some questions, but I have one uh, to start out with. Um, in these days of uh, real financial austerity, when talking to administrators, what do you think is the latest evidence to um, convince them that the adequate treatment of acute and chronic pain makes financial sense in addition to being the right thing to do. I wonder what you think about that. Well, thanks, Neil. Uh, you, uh, uh, we'll start with an easy question, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's very good. I think that uh, you're right. The economic realities of what we're doing are really what matters to a lot of the stakeholders. Um, but, but, uh, and we do try to discuss that as well. So it, 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 is, it is tremendously important. I think there are good data on individual treatment services. So in our field, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy interventions, for example, there are, there are good data on, on the cost of illness of chronic pain. There are some good data on pediatric chronic pain coming out of both the US. We did one of, uh, an early study on the cost of, of illness uh, basically a cost of pain or a cost of illness study, which is a type of economic study looking at both direct and indirect costs. And they're remarkably high. And one of the, one of the major issues is that I think it's relatively well known just how expensive chronic pain is. And also that it extends across a lifetime. So even once you look at the indirect costs of, of uh, uh, over a lifetime of people not being able to contribute in the way that they would want to or might have had the opportunity to, those costs really become quite strong. The difficulty is getting the discussion about that. And that's what I meant about make pain matter, is that you would think that actually, if you're talking about suffering, that would open a door. If you're talking about cost, that would open a door. And of course, to many people who, are, who are tasked in making some of these decisions, all chronic disease costs you money, all treatments are costing. So I think we have to bring that, that, um, that evidence to bear. And we need to do more of that. And that doesn't need to be major grant funding. I think it could be people in their treatment centers just collecting routine data on what the impact of, of their patients. That's probably more important to, to commissioners, at least when I was in this space, uh, commissioners weren't, weren't um, people who commission services or fund services, we call them commissioners in the UK, were, were less impressed by, by papers in pain and the Lancet and much more impressed by by just better understanding their own patient population. So I think we can do a lot more. Um, and, and, but I'd say that the biggest barrier for me is, is forcing that conversation, is having that conversation with people. Thanks. Uh, if people will have other questions, please send them in. Uh, in the meantime, I'll take the host's uh, uh, option and, and ask another one. Uh, in terms of w never wasting a good crisis, in the United States in particular, there's an obsession about the use of opioids and uh, it has really um, 
dampened, I would say, the reputation of a lot of pain services and, and, and uh, forced, forced us to sort of rethink a lot of what we have traditionally done. Some of that for the better, but some of it, unfortunately, the people probably suffer in the process. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about that and how we could use that crisis, if you will, to sort of improve the quality of pain management in general. You are right to, to remind me that, that in some advanced countries, if you like, that, that really the, the, even having a discussion about pain needs to be had in the context of, of opioids. And it's not, where I'm in the UK, that's, that's not yet true, but some people think that that, that will come quite quickly. The, it's certainly, uh, we, we certainly have a problem with prescribed opioids but it's not, the conversation hasn't taken over in the same way. We're still able to talk about pain without talking about the opioid crisis. And of course, in other parts of the world, and this was very sobering when I was reading, when we were writing the European Pain Management Book, there is of course more than one opioid crisis at play. In many parts of Eastern Europe and many parts of the world, people have no access to medicinal opioids. And of any sort, even palliative care, or in post-op care, in any care. So actually there are different, there's more than one crisis around opioids in the world. However, that said, I think there are some good data that are now coming out. It's the phrase good data because the data are good, but what they show is not very good. And I, I jumped over it very quickly, but one thing that was we predicted would happen in when we wrote that initial COVID paper that we're starting to see happening, there's a very nice study Actually, two very nice studies in, in Canada already coming out showing that people are, that the use of, of cannabis, uh, street cannabis, and also the use of, of opioids is, is ramping back up. Um, and I think that's going back to your earlier question. That's quite powerful. What that shows is that actually these pain services really matter. And, and uh, the conversation there is not about necessarily about pain management, but it's about harms prevention. And I do find that that's changing the conversation to, to one around harms prevention can be really quite helpful. So there was a question to us from Nicola, uh, who asked, uh, what are your opinions on residential or inpatient ma pain management centers versus community or outpatient pain clinics? Well, I think they're both important. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have one versus the other. The, 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 um, uh, I think they both need it, but they need to be offered in, in, in a in a coordinated fashion. But it's easier said than done. I mean, uh, we, we, we run residential treatment centers. They set up a residential treatment center. And actually the model was always that this would be a place of expertise that you could show that you could provide uh, multiple different uh, types of service uh, nationally and, and internationally in other places. It's actually tremendously difficult to do. So I think the, the optimal model, maybe I could turn your question into as an answer to, to my challenge, if you like, is that, that we design a system that rather than an individual service, one's harder to do. So it's not just hey, what can I do in my hospital or what can I do in my community or what can I do in my pra individual practice, but it's how do we design a service where those things are integrated and interrelated in some ways. So I think it's, and also going back to what I said, it's about better understanding the nosology and the and the clustering and the presentation of the patients so that you're, those who are need to be seen in an intensive residential type service um, aren't the same patients who are being seen in an outpatient service model. Um, so I think that sometimes we don't best understand exactly, although we, we're getting closer, but we don't have a better understand who's likely to do better in each service. So there was another question uh, regarding the medical school curriculum for, um, for pain and, and what changes you would suggest uh, are put in place to help with that. Um, obviously, you're not in the medical school world, but uh, uh, your thoughts would be obviously uh, interesting. Oh, no, but I did present that and I think, I think Dan has a, has a very good idea, very good model and, I, and I'd suggest uh, that, that you're able to look that up, but uh, no, I'm not at the moment. But I was, and I, 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 it is worth saying. So I worked, uh, I worked in, in medical psychology, teaching medical psychology to preclinical medical students at the Royal Free Hospital in London, and um, and I'll tell you that the, the most aggressive, difficult meetings I've ever been in in my life were medical curriculum meetings. 
and and it's like I think of it as theatre now, right? because people would say that people would get so passionate, you know, about their individual interests. They say you can't possibly teach this in two hours. I must. I need fifteen hours. You know? So I recognise that it's an extremely it's not an easy thing to say. You know, it's an easy thing to throw things around that, that we need more pain in the curriculum, but everybody needs more things in the curriculum. So the answer to that, I think, is threefold. One thing it's about best at targeting that training at a point when people are most receptive to, to hear it. It's no use uh, to a certain extent talking about um, most receptive mechanisms to preclinical medical students who are, try, who are just dominated by, by A and P. But really, it's about when do people really need to understand it and where might they be useful? And actually, I think that comes a bit later in the career. Secondly, it's about harnessing uh, patient support in doing that because patients can really be much more powerful than other people can in better understanding that. Um, and I guess, and I guess uh, uh, thirdly, it's a, it's a much, there's a much, uh, much more radical issue, which is, is taking a whole look at the curriculum and making it more person-centered. And that's not a world that you are correct. I mean, that's not a world that I... I'm currently, and I know there are people who are thinking very, very carefully about that. And there are some very good models around the world of how people are trying to make it more uh, patient-centered and having the learning in a very different way. Probably even where you are in Boston, it's very different to me. So, so there are probably people on this call who can, who can answer that much better than me. And I think we have time for perhaps just one more question. And, and this question was regarding the, um, oh, I just got it, uh, regarding the role of, of nutrition in, in pain as you understand it from the literature that exists and, and I'm surmising that there isn't an extensive literature on that. No, there isn't. And a good colleague of mine, Ray Bell, a number of years ago tried to bring that in. So I would encourage you to bring that in. It's interesting that we don't, we don't have a mature, uh, and I think I'm just trying to think back through that Lancet Commission and I think it's, I don't think it's mentioned, if it's mentioned at all, it's mentioned in a, in a passing way. So I, I wouldn't want to pontificate, but I think it is a, it's a significant and an important gap for us. I think. And let me just allow what, one more question. Julie Good wrote into us and said, her talk has you wondering about how we could leverage all of the big data we're collecting through our electronic medical records to improve our understanding of the interventions for pediatric pain. Uh, is the data too messy or confounded? And how could we organize the, the data better? That's a big question to leave you with. But. No, fantastic. That's great. Absolutely. Yes, that's what we need to do. So we need both small data innovation, which is around better understanding the, the both passive and, and active data, the passive data that you can capture on people's lives, that people litter around everywhere as they move around the world, but also the active data and people reporting on their individual daily lives, but also big data solutions where we can pull from uh, lots of paper patients in different areas and lots of the records that we already have. And I reckon there, there are attempts to do that within uh, longitudinal epidemiology and, uh, and there's, a, there's a whole science of, of data mm -hmm. linkage and how you actually uh, find a way through either machine learning and particular artificial intelligence solutions to pull these different data sets together. So, I'd, and in fact, in the UK, we have a, a big strategic push from one of the funders in doing exactly that. And I would really encourage you to do that. It's not, it's quite, I don't know your background for the questioner, but it's, it's quite technical, uh, technical expertise that I don't have, but it's better understanding how to do that. We have a lot of data. We collect a lot of data and it's, it's useful. It, it, we really, it's been done in other fields, but in pediatric pain, somehow we just haven't done that. So that, if somebody wants to pioneer that, if you're up for that challenge, that would be a fantastic response uh, to that to the challenge that I gave. Well, that's a, a great way to leave this. So, so thank you, Chris, so much for for doing this for us, and um, um, we really appreciate your contributions, obviously, and certainly your contribution uh, to Chalk and through this this lecture. Um, this webinar obviously couldn't have occurred without the work of a lot of people. Meredith Trent, who's the program director of, of Childkind, Pam Restler and Linda Linsalata from the Childkind board and, and Heidi Chen and, and Caitlin License from the Department of Anesthesiology and uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, who've held my hand through this whole process as I <clears throat> worried that we would sink into the mire and, and never get, get all the technical aspects done. So we appreciate that. So thank you all very much for joining us and, and keep up the good fight that all of you are engaged in. And remember when you're frustrated what the Dalai Lama said, if you think you're too small, 
make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. So uh, anyway, uh, goodbye and, and stay safe to everybody.